In the summer of 1969, humanity reached a world no one had ever walked before. Two men, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, descended toward the lunar surface inside a fragile machine made of thin metal, wires, and faith. It had no wings, no seats, no aerodynamic shape, and it could never fly on Earth. The Apollo Lunar Module, called simply the LM, or LEM, was a spacecraft like no other. It didn't soar, it fell. It didn't glide, it balanced on a column of fire in a vacuum. And once it landed, it had to lift itself off the moon and rejoin the command module waiting 60 miles above on its very first try. There was no backup, no rescue plan, only one chance to succeed. This is the story of how engineers built a spacecraft that should never have worked and yet worked perfectly six times in a row. In 1962, the race to the moon was chaos disguised as progress. NASA had committed to the Apollo program, but no one knew how to actually reach the moon. Some argued for a direct ascent, a single massive rocket that would launch from Earth, land on the moon, and return in one piece. Others backed Earth orbit rendezvous using multiple launches and assembly in orbit. But one man, engineer John Hobolt, championed a radical idea, lunar orbit rendezvous. Instead of landing the entire spacecraft, only a small lander would descend, leaving the command module safely in lunar orbit. It was efficient, it was elegant, and it was terrifyingly complex. In November 1962, Grumman Aircraft Engineering Corporation of Bethpage, New York, won the contract to design and build this lunar lander. Grumman had built carrier aircraft, not spaceships, but they had the right mix of discipline, stubbornness, and imagination. The challenge was simple to describe and impossible to achieve. A two-stage spacecraft, no more than 32 feet tall, weighing less than 35,000 pounds fully fueled, that could land on an airless world, lift off again, and dock in orbit, all on the first attempt. Grumman's chief engineer Tom Kelly described it bluntly. We were being asked to design a machine that would never operate in the environment it was built in. From the beginning, weight haunted the lunar module like a curse. Every ounce removed meant safety. Every ounce added meant failure. The LM had to be light enough for the Saturn V's S-4B stage to push it toward the moon, yet strong enough to survive descent, landing, and ascent. The engineers called it the Ounce War. At Grumman, one team would add a wider harness or thicker skin panel, while another team was ordered to remove the same mass somewhere else. It became an obsession. Even the cabin walls, barely the thickness of three sheets of aluminum foil, were cut down to the absolute limit. The pressure hull was so thin that an astronaut could poke a hole in it with a screwdriver. The structure was built from 2219 aluminum alloy, welded by hand and inspected with X-rays. The shiny gold foil seen in photos wasn't gold at all, 
it was Kapton and Mylar insulation, layered to reflect sunlight and retain heat in the frigid vacuum. Handrails were hollow, bolts were drilled out, anything that could be made lighter was. In Tom Kelly's words, we weren't designing a spacecraft, we were carving away everything that wasn't absolutely necessary for survival. By 1965, the lunar module's weight had ballooned far beyond its target, over 36,000 pounds. NASA threatened to cancel the contract, so Grumman did the unthinkable. They rebuilt the LM from scratch, panel by panel, trimming every unnecessary wire and fitting. What emerged was a spidery, skeletal craft, ugly, awkward, but astonishingly efficient. The bottom half of the lunar module was the descent stage, its engine, fuel tanks, landing legs, and equipment bays. It was the power plant, landing gear, and lifeboat all in one. At its heart, was a remarkable invention, the TRW descent engine, the first large thrust rocket motor that could be throttled smoothly from 10 to 100% power. That single innovation made a lunar landing possible. For the first time, astronauts could control their rate of descent, hover, sidestep boulders, or slow their fall with precision. The fuel was Aerozine 50, a mixture of hydrazine and unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine. The oxidizer was nitrogen tetroxide. When the two met, they ignited instantly. No spark plugs, no ignition systems, no chance of misfire. This chemical reliability came at a price, toxic fumes and high temperatures that threatened to destroy the engine's own throat. TRW's engineers solved it by suspending the combustion chamber on flexible mounts and cooling it with fuel vapor circulation. Every landing leg was a masterpiece of controlled failure. Designed by Heru Machine Parts in Quebec, each leg could absorb the impact of the 10 foot per second touchdown. At the base of each strut was a crushable aluminum honeycomb cartridge a single-use shock absorber that deformed on contact. When the lunar module touched the moon, it was essentially crashing, gently. Each leg compressed differently, letting the spacecraft settle on uneven ground without tipping. No part of the lunar module was overbuilt. Every inch of it lived on the razor's edge between strength and disaster. If the descent stage was about control, the ascent stage was about escape. It carried the crew cabin, life support systems, and one of the most terrifying engines ever built, the Bell Aerospace Ascent Engine. It had no turbo pumps, no moving parts apart from valves, no igniters, just two propellant tanks pressure fed by helium and the same hypergolic chemistry that had saved countless test flights. It could not be tested before flight because a single ignition would destroy it. Every ascent engine ever launched was a virgin burn. Bell engineers compensated with brutal simplicity. One start sequence, one ignition method, one possible outcome. If it fired, the crew lived. If it didn't, they died on the moon. To ensure reliability, the design used double redundant valves, separate feed lines, and a chamber built from welded titanium and Inconel alloys. Its thrust, about 3,500 pounds, was modest, but enough to lift the ascent stage into lunar orbit. During Apollo 13, 
when the service module was crippled, the LM's descent engine doubled as a lifeboat thruster, proving beyond doubt how dependable those simple hypergolic systems truly were. In all six moon landings, the ascent engine worked flawlessly. Six ignitions, six ascents, zero failures. Inside the cramped cabin, barely large enough for two men standing shoulder to shoulder, was a triumph of early computing, the Apollo Guidance Computer, or AGC. Weighing just 70 pounds, with only 36 kilobytes of read-only memory, it controlled the LM's attitude, velocity, and engine thrust through an interface known as the disk key, the display and keyboard. Astronauts entered commands as verb-noun pairs. Verb 37, noun 63, initiate descent program. Verb 06, noun 20, display altitude and velocity. It was the world's first truly digital fly-by-wire system written in assembly code by programmers at MIT's Instrumentation Laboratory. Every line of code was woven into magnetic core memory by hand, literally threaded by women nicknamed the Little Old Ladies of Raytheon. When Armstrong's computer flashed its now famous 1201 and 1202 alarms, the AGC wasn't failing, it was prioritizing. It was overloaded by radar data and calmly dropping non-essential tasks, allowing the landing to continue. The LM's hand controllers were another marvel, pressure-sensitive joysticks that commanded the reaction control thrusters through electrical pulses, letting Armstrong fly the unflyable. In a vacuum without wings, the lunar module responded like a dream, delicate, precise, and obedient. Before it ever touched the moon, the lunar module was pushed to destruction on Earth. At NASA's Langley Research Center, Prototypes were dropped from cranes to simulate lunar touchdowns. At Houston, full-scale mock-ups were sealed in vacuum chambers, frozen, overheated, and pounded with vibration. LM-1, an unmanned test article, suffered a catastrophic engine failure during ground testing in 1968. LM-2, rebuilt for Apollo 5, finally flew unmanned in Earth orbit proving that the descent and ascent stages could separate and redock. Then came LM-3, Spider, flown on Apollo 9. It was the first lunar module ever piloted in space. For the first time, humans fired its engines, flew free of the command module, and performed a complete orbital rendezvous. Two months later, Apollo 10 carried LM-4, Snoopy, to within 47,000 feet of the lunar surface, rehearsing every step short of landing. Each test was a lesson written in sweat, failure, and success. Every vibration test, every checklist update, every burned circuit made the next LM more reliable. By the time LM-5, Eagle, arrived at Kennedy Space Center, Grumman's engineers had ironed out thousands of issues the impossible machine was finally ready to fly. On July 20th, 1969, after a journey of 240,000 miles, the lunar module Eagle separated from the command module and began its descent toward the Sea of Tranquility. Almost immediately, things went wrong. Computer alarms, navigation errors, boulders where the radar had predicted smooth ground. Armstrong took manual control, 
guiding the LM over a crater field while mission controllers held their breath. Fuel was dropping, 60 seconds, 30 seconds. Then, a calm voice crackled through the static. Houston, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. In that moment, 400,000 engineers, technicians, and dreamers realized their creation had not only worked, it had made history. Eagle's descent engine had throttled perfectly. Its landing legs had absorbed the impact just as designed. And when the time came to leave the moon, its ascent engine lit on the first try, rising into lunar orbit to rejoin Columbia. The system had worked flawlessly. Between 1969 and 1972, 10 lunar modules flew into space. Six of them landed on the moon. Not one ever failed. They carried 12 men to the lunar surface through vacuum, radiation, and dust finer than talcum powder. Each mission pushed the design further. Longer stays, heavier payloads, greater distances from the landing site. From Apollo 11's brief visit to Apollo 17's three-day expeditions, the LM proved its resilience again and again. When the last ascent stage lifted off in December 1972, the final words from the surface were a tribute to all who made it possible. As we leave the moon at Taurus Litro, we leave as we came, and, God willing, as we shall return, with peace and hope for all mankind. The lunar module was a contradiction, fragile but indestructible, crude but brilliant, ugly yet beautiful. It represented a singular moment in human history when engineering met imagination and both were pushed beyond their limits. No spacecraft before or since has done what it did. Take off from one world, land on another, then lift off again. It remains one of humanity's greatest engineering achievements, a machine that by every law of reason shouldn't have worked, and yet worked every single time. <laughs>